verses 13 through 21, I get to preach through uh, one of my favorite 66 books, and that's the book of Luke. <laughs> I got a call about 10 a.m. yesterday that I was, uh, our pastor has a sinus infection and wanted me to teach today. So this ought to be fun and interesting, uh, but I was prepared. Uh, but anyways, prayed for him. Uh, you know, he's got a lot going on, and so does my mom and his wife. Um, so just spiritual warfare abounds. Uh, yeah, how about this Christmas party yesterday? How much fun was that? recommend you guys come next year and bring people because this was a raucous good time. I uh, I was telling somebody it's like you I expected a good time but we got a great time. It was just one of those things that teaching was great, Bob did great, uh, John did led worship, it was awesome. The Christmas carols we had a, a skip that I'm still traumatized from but it was <laughs> it was just a good time. It was just the body being together and being the body. It was exactly what I think Christ Christ wanted for his people. Um, and lots of food, which doesn't hurt. Uh, so, parable uh, in Luke 12 today, starting at verse 13. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a Calvary Road today. Uh, we're going to read a little, explain a little, read a little, explain a little, and then I'll explain why all this matters with some application. As soon as I get rid of my keys. I have this thing where I don't like to teach with stuff in my pockets. Is that weird? That's weird. Uh, verse 13. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, my brother, uh, my brother, Thomas, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And so right off the bat, we have a man battling with his brother over his family's estate, which means their father died without a will. And so right off the bat, we have an unexpected death and a patriarch of this family, and this man is seemingly, con uh, seemingly consumed, not with grief, but with greed. Second, according to the law of the time, the inheritance could not be divided until the eldest brother agreed to do so. So we know, now know that this younger brother is upset with his older brother, who is in charge of putting his, everything in its proper order. And I'm sure this is starting to sound familiar to some of you. So the man, who is the younger brother, calls Jesus teacher. Now, a teacher, or a rabbi, what he said, was an expert of the law. So this young man actually is making a legal request. This is, not, this is not an ask for guidance on how to navigate this tragedy. This younger brother wants his money, and he wants it now. G.G. Wentworth, right? He's one step away from suing his brother. One step away. So this man is asking Jesus to divide this land and ultimately split up a family. So Jesus responds and he calls him man, not friend or by name, but man. It's a term of displeasure. So Jesus is already annoyed with the guy. <laughs> because Jesus' heart is to keep families together, not to split them up. In fact, part of what he came for was to die to make a family. <laughs> And so Jesus is displeased with this man, and he's going to tell him a story. I love this. Verse 15. Then he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist of the abundance of the things he possesses. Okay, so right off with the bat, Jesus starts his parable with his conclusion, which is a great message for preachers. Get to the point sometimes pretty quickly. Uh, uh, but he gets right to his conclusion, and, and that is a warning of covetousness and greed. That life is about so much more than things. I love that old saying, you never see U-Hauls attached to hearses. <laughs> At the end of your life, every single one of us, when we stand before God, you are boiled into one of two things. You are either a Christian or you are not a Christian. That is the sum of your life. The Passover, it's the Passover. You are either under the blood of the Lamb, or you are not. How many of Egyptians paid their taxes, were loyal statesmen, were good to their kids, yet they weren't under the blood of the Lamb, and so they were judged. 
That is what our lives boil into. Morality is not enough. And this Christian life that we are to be living is about so much more than money. Who you are is, is not what you own. Who you are is not what you do. You as a person are so much more than what someone pays you to do. <laughs> okay, so your life and my life and our life is about so much more than money and stuff and career. Okay, so right off the bat, Jesus, the creator of all things, the King of kings and Lord of the lords, tells us of what importance money is. It's secondary, it's third days. Saying, don't let this become your identity. And listen, Jesus speaks more on money than he does about prayer and the Gospels. And it should tell us something. That, 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 that should tell us where we're most likely to fall. And where we're most likely to cause division. And most likely to lose ourselves. And our pastor just is going through 2 Timothy, which is one of my favorite books of the Bible. You know, I say oh, they're all my favorite, if you've noticed. But I love 2 Timothy. I love 2 Timothy chapter 3. And in verses 1 and 2, our pastor just read this, so I'm going to be brief. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, tells us that as soon as a lover of self turns to greed, he loses himself entirely. The man no longer is a lover of self-preservation or self-interest or self-lust, but is now lost to something all-consuming. He loses himself to this idea, to this career, to something all-consuming. And, and back to our story, this young man's greed made him trample on the grave of his father, has made him vehemently opposed to his brother, and most tragically has brought him into the very presence of God Almighty himself. This man is standing in front of the God Almighty himself, and he's consumed with cash. Here is a younger brother standing in front of the Savior of the world, the very man who can save his soul from an eternity in hell, and he believes his inheritance is of a greater importance. He has 2 Timothy 3, 2, lost himself entirely. He's forsaking his soul for this thing that he's wrapped up in. And so Jesus now is going to give him a parable that's very fitting to this young man. And as we read this portion, notice how selfish this rich man is. So here's a cool, cool tip. So one part of my job is to help pick you up and encourage you. But the other part of my job is to help you read your Bibles better. So whenever Jesus tells a story, you want to pay attention to how much the characters refer to themselves. Okay? In these three verses, the man's going to refer to himself in various ways over 15 times. <laughs> so we have a very selfish individual on our hands. So verse 16. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. Then he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? You hearing it? <laughs> So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Okay, so upon first glance, this is a selfish, self-centered, self-interested rich man, but there's a touch more going on here upon closer inspection. So first, barns. Barns in the Bible are an image of abundance. So I want you to think about running a farm in the Middle East. <laughs> you probably don't have tons of excess, right? And if you do, you maybe have a cellar or some stuff in it. But if you had a barn, a barn symbolized that you were doing so well, you had a huge savings account, right? You were more than making bonds. It was a sign of an accumulation of wealth. And notice in verse 18, in 18 he will pull, pull down his barns and build bigger barns. So the character of the story is starting already vastly wealthy. To have so much food, you not only fill a singular barn, but multiple barns. And you not only have filled multiple barns, but now you need to tear them down and build bigger multiple barns. Is the problem of the 1% of the 1%. It is a very rare problem this man has. And I would like to add a footnote here before we move on, because here's a trap. The Bible warns so much about greed and money 
that there's this thing that happens that people that are wealthy start to feel like, am I doing something wrong? And that's not the case at all. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing to, to be wise in business. It's a good thing to have a good job. You should never feel guilty about those things. Abraham, vastly rich. Uh, Job, vastly rich. Uh, our examples in Acts chapter 2, they invited people into their house. If you have a house big enough to invite a whole church, you have, you're doing pretty good. They are our models and our examples. We see Phoebe in Romans chapter 16. She seems to be a woman of considerable wealth, and she is one of our examples. But at this time, passages like Proverbs 11, 26 warns against uh, storing and withholding grain when others in your community were hungry. When having access when your fellow believer starves. And so what's being pointed out, so to speak, is here his barns pick cast a shadow in some slums. You know, he's hoarding himself his own wealth as the covenant community of Israel is perishing and struggling. And he's getting richer and richer and richer at the detriment of the people around him. And a big part of the law was taking care and providing food and leaving the edges of the field available. So so, so homeless people could eat, and, and, and the handicapped could eat, and all those sorts of things. And this man obviously isn't abiding by that. Secondly, over 15 times he refers to himself. Verse 17 says he dialogues with himself. And believe it or not, as much as boasting is put on display, and as much as selfishness is put on display, Jesus is also describing a tragedy. This is a very sad scene, because in the Middle East, village people always make decisions about important topics after long discussions with their family and friends and communities and villages because people lived life together. They were so intertwined. Everyone's business was everyone else's business. Even trivial decisions like where should I store my trash cans? People would all talk about it, you know? They did life together. But this man has no family to talk to. He has no friends to talk to. He has no community to talk to. This man talks to himself. This man appears to have cut himself off from everyone else around him. He's the only person he could dialogue with because his greed has isolated him, has made him completely alone. This rich man's love of money, like this young man, as 2 Timothy 3, has completely overtaken every facet of his life. And so this wicked man plans on making even more money and thinks, then I'll be happy. So once I have super wealth, then I can relax, then I'll drink, then I'll be merry. And then verse 20. Here's God's estimation of things. But God said to him, fool. This night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So it is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. What a warning, huh? Okay. We're going to close with five points. <laughs> they all work together, so I don't work out. Point one. God's response to the man is to call him a fool. It is a fool who puts mammon above God. It is a fool who puts the created above the creator. Now, in the Greek, there is a play on words here. This rich man in verse 19 says, he will be merry. It's the Greek, yophrino. And God says in verse 20, no, you are a fool. It's a throne. It's a, it's a play on words to show that the man thought with all his money he would achieve bliss. But in the end, all he would really achieve is judgment upon himself. God calls him a fool and says, this night your life will be required of you. A biblical fool in the Bible. It's important this will help you read your Bible better. Whenever you see the word fool in the Bible, what the Bible is really describing is an atheist. It's someone who lives as if there is no God. So someone who walks into a school and shoots lots of kids is someone who acts like when they die, there's going to be no accountability. That is a biblical fool. It's someone who acts as if there is no accountability. So when fool dies, when an atheist dies, that means eternal judgment. And so this man thinks he's going to be set for a long, merry life, and then suddenly he discovered that his soul, his life, his self, was not his, but was on loan from God, who could demand the return of the loan at any time. In the Greek text, the phrase, your soul, yourself, is napis, is required of you. 
It's the language of the return of a loan. I think that's really interesting. This man is so obsessed with money, God says, okay, <laughs> time to pay up your loan. And it was his very life. This is one of the major, often hidden truths of Scripture. That life is not a right, but is a loan from God. Listen, we, we have no right to life, either for 10 days or for 80 years. Each day is a gift from God. Now, there is this story in the Gospels. Jesus says he's going to die. Remember Jesus, Jesus tells his disciples, I'm going to die? And what is Peter doing? Peter goes, not on my watch, Lord. <laughs> and then he slices someone's ear in the process, and Jesus is like, come on, Pete. You know, it's one of those deals. But what does Jesus <laughs> say to Peter? He says, get behind me. Satan. Satan. Okay. Let me tell you another story. Satan, uh, Satan's trying to convince uh, Eve of this fruit of the serpent, right? And uh, she goes, well, I'll surely die. And he goes, you won't die, right? It's great. It's delicious. It goes about the moly or whatever, right? And... <clears throat> And, she, and, and, and he says, you know, it, it, you, you won't die. So here, here's a cool truth. Christians must always live knowing. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Um, it is from the very mouth of Satan to reject and ignore death. It's all through Scripture. And it is from the very heart of Jesus that to die is to gain. In fact, every Christian is already supposed to be dead to themselves. That's the beginning of our good journey to die. <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing every non-believer runs from, right? Christians must always live knowing life is a gift and death is gain, which is the complete opposite of life as a right and death as a loss or worse, not acknowledged. So my, my, my wife, her aunt, um, she, like 20 years ago, um, her aunt uh, became pregnant with twins. And they, as the pregnancy came along and they did sonograms, they realized that the twins were gonna die in the womb or they might just barely live. And they recommended, it's a fancy word they called termination in these murder. And uh, they said, we recommend you terminate the baby. And the woman goes, how dare you, you know? Um, and she goes, I'm giving birth to these babies. Very similar to the story we just had in this church. And <clears throat> the babies were born. And they had 24 hours with them. And the babies passed away. And at the funeral service a week later, everyone's crying, it's one of those things. And the mother gets up on stage. And she has all the photos of the twins behind them. And she goes, I thank God every day for the 24 hours God gave me with my children. There is a woman who understood that every second we have is a precious, precious gift from God. Yet this is another reason for Christians to be a people marked with gratitude. We should be so grateful. We're still here. <laughs> We're still, we still have the honor and the privilege to be employed by God to do anything. Yet he does. Yet he does. This is another reason why the church is so precious. If every day is a gift, how much more precious for all of us, the whole body, to gather every week. Every time we gather is a demonstration of the faithfulness and generosity of God to preserve us and to assemble us together and to enjoy Him and to testify of Him. And so we should never take our life and our gathering lightly. We are a blood-bought community of faith that the king of the universe stepped off his throne and died so that we could do this. This is not a trivial thing. This isn't, this isn't, well, I'll give God an hour. I won't sleep in today like you're doing him a favor. No, this is a, a precious, precious gift that we must not take the gathering of the saints lightly. Secondly, the story ends the way it begins with a warning on, on the peril, the warning about the perils of greed. That is, the chase the almighty dollar to obsess over money is a course set for many destructions. And so I want to talk about this for a second. I want to talk about the warnings of greed just within this text. So, and this is a question. Does greed tear apart families? Has anyone ever heard of this before? <laughs> I have a friend. I have a friend. Uh, he, he said 20 years ago, his, his, uh, his, mom, his mom's mom died. And of course, there was a land grab for them, for all the stuff. 
Uh, and the one sister took all the jewelry. And he says, for 20 years, my mom every day, without fail, has brought up that her sister stole her mother's jewelry. Her, her mother's jewelry. And for 20 years, they have not spoken over that jewelry. Uh, and, 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 he, and he told me, he said, it is literally killing her. She, this is literally, it's distorting her, this anger that's only building and building and building. And in this story, right, this man is at war with his brother. I mean, when someone dies, it's the time for the family to pull together. It's not a time to hate each other. Greed places money of a higher priority than God. Is this true? Yeah. <laughs> How many people choose to work on Sundays? To hear this story, this man is standing in front of God Almighty. And what's he consumed with? Money. Who cares? <laughs> but he's consumed. Greed makes a man lose all his friends. Is this true? Yeah. I have someone in my family, and I'll go here so you can't blast them. Um, but everybody they meet, they treat like a commodity. Oh, you have a boat, I'll be friends with you this summer. <laughs> Everyone's a means to some sort of end. And what ends up happening, just like in this story, they end up all by themselves with no one to talk to. And they become alone. And they think they keep gaining, but really they just keep losing. Greed is never satisfied. Is this true? Yeah. You know, I shared this one time, but you'll never meet a happy, selfish person. It's true. The more selfish you are, the more angry and bitter you will become. Because selfishness is always frustrated at their spouse, or their kids, or their co-workers, because you're failing me. You're not meeting my expectations of what you need to be doing for me. And it's never satisfied. It's the story of the barns. He already had enough food for a lifetime, and yet he wanted food for four lifetimes. And guess what? When he got that, it wouldn't have been enough. He would have built bigger, bigger barns. That's how this works. So point three, Augustine once said, my soul is restless until I rest in thee. Greed, like a long list of sins, easily becomes all-consuming. And we don't have time for it. But if we kept reading Luke 12, we would read that great line, look at the ravens. They depend on their Heavenly Father. They store up. Or they don't store up, yet God provides. And point being, trust in God. That's what Jesus is getting at here. God is your treasure. God needs to be your security, not money, not a house, not a wife, not a husband, God. That the birds are an example for us, that they depend on God and are sustained. All that other stuff could get ripped from you anyways. I see so many people put their whole identity in their spouses. You know how many marriages I've seen fall the apart? That's a horrible thing to put your whole identity in. Let alone say you guys are soulmates. How many cancers I've seen people lose spouses? How many people put their whole identity in their home? How many homes burn to the ground or get lost or flooded or God knows what? We must build our lives upon God and then build our faith upon the finished work of the cross. My neighbor, my neighbor was a Methodist. She, she went to a Methodist church for 30 years. She went faithfully. And she just, uh, a few years ago, she got sick. And she stopped going to church. And I started talking to her. Um, and, and she sort of implied, God failed me. <coughs> and I tried to walk her through all this, and I tried to do all that, but what I basically got to, and I lovingly said, you built your whole relationship with God upon what he can do for you. And now he's broken the agreement that you set on him. <laughs> God never promises us well. He never promises us that we're going to be free of sickness. He promises us an eternity in communion with Jesus and, and the Father and the Spirit, which is infinitely grander than any of that anyways. So a, prof a professing Christian like my neighbor who builds the relationship with God upon what God will do for them are just like this young man. They stand in front of the presence of God Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and take communion and do the prayers and sing the songs and yay Jesus. But really, they're asking God, what are you going to do for me because of all the stuff I've done for you? As opposed to a genuine believer who stands in front of the presence of God and says, God, thank you for what you've already done for me. 
And so greed, an unquenchable lover of possessions, shows itself in many, many ways. And so as the church, as we're warned by Christ over and over and over again, we have to be and stay on guard. We have to look out for each other in this regard. And so very quickly, a few practical steps to kind of help keep our guard. And obviously the first one is be in the Word. Be in the Word. If you are not in the Word, everyone thinks I probably should be reading more. It will help me. Yeah, that's very true. Um, but as believers, right, our lives are no longer about ourselves. It's about everyone else. And so really when you're not reading your Bible, you're ultimately hurting your family more than you're hurting yourself. Because your life's not really about you anyways. Right? So you're really hurting all the people that you should be good for. Another one, of course, is prayer, communion with God. But also, here's a fun thought. If the chief result of greed is isolation, then the very best thing you can do to fight greed would be to be in a community. <laughs> right? Spend time with believers. Let them challenge you and ask questions. Bring life decisions to people you don't really need approval from, but could use wisdom in the matter anyways. The body of Christ is a gift, and we need to treat it as such. And our culture, my God, is spitting out individuality at an alarming rate. And people have never been more miserable. People have never been on more anxiety medications and depression medications, and people are miserable, and the country's going to hell, and all this sorts of stuff. But it's because we're, we're, we're thriving and breeding selfishness. We're called to live as a community. So I want you to think about this. God told Adam and Eve in the garden, what did he tell them? Be fruitful and multiply. Where's that trajectory? If you keep building enough people in the same location, you end up building a city. So God's first design, God's first request towards Adam and Eve was to turn this garden into a city. Now man failed. <laughs> and what do we see at the very last book, uh, in the very last few chapters of Revelation? God finishes the city we should have built <laughs> as he brings it down out of heaven. Which, so once again, there's community. God, met, God made man into the image of its creator. God is Trinitarian by nature. So we, at a cellular level, are made after a family. What about within the context of the church? When God took his people out of Egypt, what did he do? He set up the priesthood and the tabernacle, the church. When Jesus started his ministry, what did he do? He assembled the twelve, the church. When the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, what did he do? He had 120 and he added 3,000 more, starting the church. We were made and demonstrated to by all three members of the Trinity individually <laughs> to do life with others. That is God's design for a healthy, happy human being. And isolation and selfishness and the I life re leads to ruin. And I just said this, but you'll never see a happy, selfish person. Because selfishness is never satisfied. It's never enough. God has designed us at a cellular level, demonstrated by all three members of the Trinity individually, that we were designed for so much more than one. So much more. God has designed a human being to thrive on making their life about more than themselves. Question, the happiest people in your life. I guarantee you they're generous. I guarantee you the happiest people in your life are the people that give the most of themselves because that's how God's designed us to function in joy and peace and happiness to someone who's always offering to give you their time and to give an ear and listen and care. That's why the most generous people, the most giving people of their time people, the most compassionate people are often the happiest people. They're doing what they were created for, to both love and be loved, to enter into love multiplied and to be part of that. So if anyone's struggling with depression and anxiety and, and you're frustrated and people are driving you crazy, start plugging into people. Start giving of yourself because that's the last thing you're going to want to do. And it ends up, because of, by the way, that we were designed, God starts to heal you through that. And he starts to bring you joy. And he starts to bring you happiness. And he starts to free you from your anxieties. Because we were designed that way. And then fourthly, this one's quick. Jesus summons this younger brother to consider economic justice 
from the perspective of who really owns all of it. All of this belongs to God. All of it. Coffee's called gross. Uh, Jesus <laughs> threw this parable into it. Come on. We can put a man on the moon, but we can't make it to us. Uh, Jesus, through this parable, indirectly says, suppose you win this fight over that inheritance. What then? Okay, you win the money. You win. Now you're alone like this rich fool. You're alone. You have nothing. Look beyond your earthly life. You're arguing over something that's really not even yours anyways. This young man's inheritance was exactly like this rich young fool's crops. Neither one had anything to do with their new fortune. <laughs> this young man didn't choose what family he was born into to receive this inheritance. This rich, this, this, uh, this rich fool couldn't make it rain to bless his crops. God did it all anyways. You know, I was a youth pastor for 10 years, and this is something I used to teach young people all the time. If you have a gift, learn to cultivate it. Learn to grow it, and then practice it. Be the best that you can be. But never forget, God gave you the ability to do all those things. <laughs> all honor and praise and thankfulness always belongs to God. Anything else is error. This rich fool was saying, my, 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 my. And what did God call him? A fool. This rich fool failed to account for his mortality. Failed to account that he had a creator. And by doing this, he failed in securing both his life and his possessions. He lost everything in this. There's a great story. I love nature shows. My dad watches them all the time. And he got me hooked. So I'm watching Planet Earth, Blue Planet Earth 2 on Netflix right now. I'm in deep. But we're watching, and I love these sorts of things. But there's, uh, there's this one scene in one of these documentaries. Um, it's in Africa or Southeast Asia. And they take a coconut. And they bore a hole in a coconut and they put rice in it. And then they take the coconut with a string and they tie it. And then they tie the under end to a tree. And a monkey walks by and goes, boom, free food. And he puts his hand in the hole and he grabs the rice. But as soon as he grabs the rice, his fist is now larger than the hole in the coconut. And they start freaking out, you know, and they're wailing the coconut around. And if they just let go of the rice, they're free. They never let go of the rice. That is selfishness and pride and greed. It's like laying hold of an anchor as it hits water. And the longer you hold on, the more peril you become. The worse it gets, the more destructive and all-consuming it becomes. If you find yourself holding on to the anchor this morning, for the love of God, let it go. And cry out to him. This is not very relevant, but it's totally relevant. I just saw a news article in New York City. A rat got into an ATM machine and ate all the money and died because its stomach expanded. I couldn't find a way to fit this neatly, but there it is. You know? Stop eating the money in the ATM. Fifthly, fifthly, we'll, we'll close on this and then five more points. No, no, no. Last one. Don't tempt me. The truly good and abundant life is, found, is to be found in verse 21. Verse 21 is the key in treasuring up for God rather than for self. Catching the theme? All five points work together. I just made it neat for you note takers, okay? So, the problem with this rich fool is he didn't know God. They didn't try to know God. He was busy doing business stuff, important stuff. And as a result, why would he store all his treasure in God? Right? The point is, if you took the time to know who God is, if you took the time to learn who Jesus is and how he feels about you, then no sacrifice would be too much. And guys, this is not chiefly about money. It's part of it. It's about so much more. It's about our time. It's about our passions. It's about our creativity and our desires. It's about consecrating all of those things to God. God doesn't own one part of your life as a believer. You've given him every part of your life. Listen, when God saves you, right? Does he save some of you? He saves all of you. <laughs> 
And when he calls you into service, does he call some of you into service? He calls all of you into his service. It's about giving it all to God. Listen, God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son to die, at the, uh, die on a cross at the chance of acquiring you. And Jesus loves you so much, he freely did it. And so hear me, Jesus speaks of us as his bride. As a wife he longingly adores, who he doesn't just love, for God so loved the world. God so loves you. And Jesus speaks of us. When he speaks of us, speaks of us. It's as a dad who runs to his child and bear hugs him in Luke 15 and kisses and kisses and kisses him. When Jesus speaks of us, it's as a shepherd who travels through valleys and peaks and dangerous perils and mountain passes and regains even one of us that runs astray. As God's people, if we are anything, it is so loved by the way Jesus describes us. We are so valuable to God. You're not just saved, you're invested in. <laughs> he is invested in your life. When Jesus died for you, he conferred a value on you. The Jesus, <laughs> I understand in a room this size, you know, that there are a lot of needs and pains and it's Christmas and that there are all those, you've lost loved ones and tragedies and some of us have betrayals of this particular season It's particularly painful. But I want you to know that if you know Jesus, and you love Jesus, then he is yours, and you are his, and he is invested in you. And we're told that one day he will present you faultless, as spotless and without blemish before his Father. And he will wipe away every tear from your eye, and you will know no more pain, no more sickness, but only joy. For Jesus, there was no cross, cost too great, no price too high. Jesus sacrificed everything for us. <laughs> he cut himself off from his Father for us. He offered his life as a beaten, stabbed, and torn ransom for men. He withheld nothing from us. And if we truly believe this, why would we withhold anything from him? And if the wages of sin are death, of which we are all guilty, and Jesus put the bill by his shed blood, how could we not live for him? And if we were all dead in trespasses and sin, and like, like we were just heading for hell, but before a holy and perfect and spotless God, we fully deserved an eternity of it. And Jesus said, no. For all who believe in me will not perish, but have everlasting life, and took that wrath upon himself for us. If that's true, and it is, how could we not be so filled with gratitude? and joy, and thankfulness. And it's not that, and not just has Jesus saved us unto eternity, he reconciled us to the Father. Like Jesus, like, like Jesus, is, uh, Jesus is God, right? What does he say? I now go to my Father and your Father. I now go to my God and your God. God Jesus, we not only gain Jesus, we now receive the Spirit. We not only gain Jesus and receive the Spirit, we're now reconciled with the, with the Father. You know the Bible ends, the last chapter of the Bible ends with something fancy called the beatific, but the last picture in the Bible is man stands face to face with the Father. And John stops writing the book and then gives an invitation to come. That is where we're headed. So not only Jesus, not only has he saved us on the cross, and not only does he have a glorious future plan for us, but I think the selfish part of us, if we're honest, says, well, what about now? <laughs> but Jesus also fulfills our problems now, doesn't he? He also helps us now, doesn't he? He doesn't have to, but he does. Jesus Christ has dug countless of us from the pit of drug addiction, hasn't he? And for that, how could we not be grateful? How could we not celebrate and glorify and praise him for those things? Jesus Christ has saved countless of us from the all-consuming fire that is pornography. And for that, how could we not celebrate and praise Him? Jesus Christ has helped make us better fathers, has made us better mothers, has made us better grandparents, has helped make us better employees and better employers and better spouses, has pulled us out of cancers and diseases and illnesses, 
For that, how could we not praise him with our life? And then in the next, cast our crowns at his feet and say, boy, we're not worthy of any of this. <laughs> how many of us have a wake of devastation on our paths until we responded to Jesus? So many. So many of us were dead and are now alive, and the only thing bridging the gap is the person of Jesus Christ and our faith in Him and the saving power of the cross. And now, out of the abundance of gratitude and love we have for Him, we proudly serve the source of our life, the source of our being, the source of our joy, the source of our peace, the source of our family, the source of our eternity. If this is true, if Jesus died for sinners like us, how could we withhold anything from him. How could we not give him our all as he gave his all for us? Because Jesus will always be worth it to find our treasure in our barns or our degrees or heck, even good things like our kids or our spouse or our work. All those things are mere drops of comfort and pleasure and goodness in the ocean of God's mercy and love and plans for his people. And so believers, if Christ be your treasure and not a means to something else, then brothers and sisters, friends, know how loved you are and know that nothing, no, not nothing, can separate you from the love of God. And the love that he has planned for you not only exists now, it exists unto eternity, through the rest of forever. <laughs> For you are God's beloved, chosen before the foundations of the world. You have been adopted. When someone adopts a kid, do they get rid of them when they break the lamp in the living room? <laughs> no. <laughs> you're, you're his. And you're going to mess up. And you're going to spill juice on his carpet. And it's okay. Because he loves you. And you're adorned by a faithful husband. You ever read in Ephesians what Paul says, what a husband's supposed to be to a wife? You think he's going to break his own rule because you frustrate him sometimes? He's yours. And he is in love with you. And we're told by God he's a proud papa. My kid throws like 15 tantrums a day. And I just love his fat little face even when he's crying, you know? <laughs> That's God with us. He loves us even when we're throwing fits. He loves us. Don't fall into the trap of a rich young fool and settle for lesser temporal, temporal pleasures. But let Christ be your treasure. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we ask that you rededicate us today. That you light a fire in us that we have never known before. I think of the letter in Revelation they lost their first love. God, don't let us lose our first love. Let us be zealful for your name's sake. Be passionate for your name's sake. Let us love and adore your people. Let us desire to be with the body as you instructed to help keep us from error. God, help us to offer everything that we are to you, God. And, and of course, money, but also our time, our affections. And let us check in on each other and realize that every moment we're here, that in this vapor of a life, is an opportunity to glorify and serve you. And as you gave us everything within yourself so that we may be saved, God, now that we are saved, let us give everything in gratitude. And so we love and adore and praise you, God. We ask that you bless this time of giving. We as the ushers come down and hand out the everything. God, we ask that if anyone needs prayer, let them be strong enough to admit that they're weak right now. And go and get prayer with Bob and Debbie and, and even someone they brought and just say, I need you to pray for me. God, give us the strength to do those things. And let the body be the body now, God. And let the spirit move so mightily in us that we do it. <laughs> and so we love and adore you in Jesus' name. Amen.